Cool. Thanks, guys. All right. Thanks so, for I'm Matt Jones. I'm the Extension Horticulture Agent for Chatham County. Um, I live down the road here, but I, I work primarily in Chatham County. And uh, what the hell does that mean? You know, <laughs> what is Extension? What 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 is it? What can we do for you all? And and that sort of thing. So I'm gonna go over that, and then kind of. Uh, pivot a bit towards the end how we can help you directly in say disease and pest diagnosis if you see it in the field and how to submit samples to me and, and to the lab on campus if needed. So Extension is uh, essentially the public outreach arm of the land grant universities in each state. We'll talk about what land grant means in a second but we're essentially local campuses for NC State and NC A&T State University. So every county will have a county center uh, instructors essentially that act in or work in different program areas. So some counties will have a combination of ag agents, field crops, livestock, horticulture, and then 4-H of course is part of extension, youth education, and there's even family consumer sciences which is the new new word for home economics. Uh, but uh, so that, those are the kind of field level and then uh, in the counties we also have volunteers like the Master Gardener volunteers, 4-H youth volunteers, but then we're connected to campus through uh, extension specialists who are professors that have uh, not only research and, on, and uh, uh, classroom teaching responsibilities, but um, have to do applied research and applied outreach to the public. Uh, and so from that, we don't have to read the mission division, but the, there are 101 county centers, so every county does have an office, um, and so does the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. And then, um, you know, we, quite a significant ec economic impact, really, um, if you consider all the staff and all the programs we do, often at no cost. So the, um, it started with the Morrill Act in the 1860s, in the middle of the Civil War. There was legislation passed giving um, state governments money from the feds uh, and land that if, if they want to develop a university that focuses on applied in mechanical arts, that included agriculture and engineering primarily, then um, if, if they got the money, if they got the land, then they would have to establish an arm within the university that was for uh, public outreach. And that evolved into the uh, Smith-Lever Act of 1914. That's what formally established extension. So in that sense, we've been around a long time. And, uh, and we're, uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, the best kept secret in that we've, we do a lot, but no one knows what we do. And I think part of that is a branding issue because it's such a clumsy name. But um, every state will have a land grant university, sometimes two. So uh, often, if, especially if it's like the Midwest or the central part of the US, um, if the university has the word state in it, it's probably the land grant university, but not always. Exceptions would be like Florida, or Illinois, or Arizona, um, Idaho, those are all the land grant universities in those states. Uh, and then so that we, um, professors on campus, and the, the theory would be the professors on campus have specific applied research um, foci, and they uh, try to tackle problems that farmers or arboriculturists or whoever are facing, and um, address that issue, and then use extension agents to help um, spread the word on on that issue and, and, and educate educate the public and then also that it works both ways though So we're in the field and we get input from you all about what needs further research or what um, Program areas or education areas are needed and we direct that back up to campus Accordingly, that's how it works in theory in practice. It's a lot messier, but uh, so we're all uh, university employees, but in, in the case of agents half my salary comes from the county and nominally, my county jurisdiction jurisdiction is is uh, Chatham County, and then uh, the the state university, the NC State, gets some of its money from the feds, uh, from the USDA actually, um, and different states have different legislation related to how that funding gets shifted, and sometimes it can be very bad. Like in Pennsylvania, they had a, a separate line item on the on the in the state budget, and so it became. Um, something to fight about <laughs> in the uh, partisan, a really partisan period, um, and so extension got decimated in Pennsylvania. In Massachusetts, it was practically eliminated, um, and instead, UMass Amherst kind of does direct outreach from the professors. So it gets a little messy in, in some some legacy areas. Oh, like in, in New York too, Cornell is the extension, is a land grant university, so it's actually private. It's the only private extension related university. So uh, who at extension can help you and how? 
At, on, at the campus level, uh, again, remember that the professors on campus with extension appointments are called specialists. And for you all, the go-to person would be Dr. Barb Fair. She has a lot of great information out there. She has a, her website has really good videos on tree planting, tree pruning, and tree fertilization. And she does an amazing talk on soil preparation because if, if with enough um, upfront preparation, you can plant all sorts of things if the soil is, is well prepared. But it requires very large scale um, and expensive preparation. Uh, the, and the, uh, she illustrates what, what can happen if you look at the Museum of Art in Raleigh. Um, the, um, uh, uh, what's the, Goodnight, the Goodnight family, they put a lot of money into, <laughs> um, and they've done some amazing things with the site, but it doesn't need to be that extensive. Then at the county level, each county will have a, an eight, at least in the, in the triangle region, each county will have a dedicated horticulture agent or two. So I'm the horticulture agent in Chatham County, and there's also Debbie Roos, who you may know, she's the sustainable ag agent and she does a lot of pollinator gardening outreach, et cetera. But she covers fruit and vegetable growers, um, and I focus on nurseries, landscapers, and home gardeners. Uh, in Orange County, Mark Bumgardner, um, it, Bumgardner rather, is the horticulture agent, but he also does field crops, because their system is set up a little bit differently. Um, so he also has to handle um, uh, you know, soybeans and, and, and tobacco and that sort of thing. Uh, and then Ashley Troth is the agent. She's fabulous in uh, Durham County. She has an appointment very similar to my own. Um, Wake County, the recent uh, agent retired a few months ago, so um, we'll work at the speed of the state government. So <laughs> eventually they'll hire someone else. Um, and then Amanda Wilkins, who you may know from the Juniper Level Botanical Garden, is now the agent in Lee County. Um, I'm from Oklahoma originally, went to OU, started studying botany and microbiology, like that, stayed for a master's and then realized I like teaching better than research, didn't know what extension was, enrolled in this master gardener program locally um, under the radar of my professor and uh, realized, oh, this is amazing. I'm gonna do that with what she's doing. Um, and so um, that's where I found extension and decided like, I, need to, I need to do this. But to do that, I, wanted to, I needed to train more in horticulture. And so uh, this was 20, the 2009, 2010. So none of the grad programs in the US had much money. Uh, but the Europeans think ahead, so <laughs> I was able to find this sweet program uh, in Europe where I spent some time in Bologna and Munich and, and, and Vienna studying horticulture and gypsy moth, actually. Um, it's, it's native there. Um, we were looking at does the application of BT affect how a native pathogen controls populations. But, um, so I am an expert in gypsy moth um, uh, crap, like literally frass. I studied, I extracted <laughs> fungal spores from gypsy math turds. Okay. What um, is BT? Oh, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis. So this is a bacteria, a soil bacteria that's used to control caterpillars. It's like the oldest organic pesticide, been around since the 40s. Um, and it only affects caterpillars, they have to consume it. Um, and then I spent a summer at the Arnold Arboretum, and I, that's when we got to work. I got to work with arborists finally. We would rotate you in different areas, and I was always really intimidated by the arborists. So, but they're really cool. They're really nice, and uh, they put me up the top like a seventy-foot hemlock, and you know, I acted like a gypsy moth. And anyway, <laughs> yeah, I got a little scared, but I'm good. So I respect. I respect the climbers. Not my thing. Yeah, and then, uh, uh, then I spent a few years in California um, with the California Extension and looking at almonds, pistachios, and walnuts. Um, and then was in Harnett County for a few years and did a lot of work with like sweet potatoes. Um, and then moved uh, here, moved to um, um, a Chatham County 2018. Oh, I got this slide out of order. Um, and so, like I said, in Chatham County, I focus on commercial nurseries, uh, landscapers, um, and then home and community gardens and also oversee the master gardener program in the county. So we'll have 76 of those this fall, um, finally. Um, and uh, so they, uh, we train volunteers to help answer all the gardening questions we get. We get about 2,000 a year. And so they help, help us um, answer those. Um, and so in Chatham, um, and you're probably seeing this in other counties nearby, the, the main situation is the tension between trying to maintain the rural character of the county um, and all this um, ex expansion with Chatham Park and other developments. And uh, so my, my education program then focuses on um, how to you know, mitigate environmental impact. What can you do in your own landscape to increase biodiversity, structural diversity, um, and, um, and you know, improve water quality, composting, vegetable gardening, that sort of thing. 
Um, and uh, the, the main, my main link for you all, though, can is to help diagnose problems in the field. Um, for you. So if you've got an ornery set of symptoms that you cannot quite determine, one, I can come out to the site and help, help you maybe diagnose that there. Um, and then if not, I can always get, um, we, can, we can cover our, our rear ends and submit samples to the plant disease and insect clinic, which I'll describe in a second. So if in order to help diagnose problems, I will need to know in advance what the species is, what symptoms you're seeing, how they're distributed on the plant. Are you seeing it in the canopy? Are you seeing it on the trunk? Are you seeing canopy dieback? Uh, what are the distribution of the symptoms on the individual tissues? What do they look like? Uh, the shape, color, I mean, photos are really helpful, of course. Make sure they're decent photos. This is an actual photo I got sent. Um, That's what and, I'm sorry about. No, 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 it wasn't. Uh, so, so, um, uh, so photos are helpful. Just make sure they're good. They, if they're in scale, it helps a lot, um, especially with, with pests. Um, but it, it, but tree diseases are, diseases especially, are among the hardest to diagnose. There's not uh, as much understood about the suite of diseases that all tree species get. We, we deal with a lot of different species. There's, um, uh, crop plants are far more well understood. Um, uh, and so, uh, and also because the lab technicians, the pathologists from the, who, the real specialist in this field can't come to the field with you, we have to collect them, um, put a lot of uh, deliberate thinking in how we collect the sample. So if you find that the client especially needs a sample submitted um, or you need, you need to cover your own uh, butt to <laughs> determine if it is truly pathogenic or a severe issue or not, or if, like in many cases, they might see leaf spots and freak out, right? And you can just say, well, it's really nothing, but if you want, if you want backup, that's what we're, what we're here for. So if you find you're in a particularly tight space or need help diagnosing things, let me know. And if you can't come back to the site in a timely manner, just let the client know and I can schedule that and, and help collect the sample too. If you're in the field at the moment though, and know that, um, and, and it just, just text me that I, I've got an issue, I'm gonna try to collect a sample, what, how should I do this? That would, that would help me a lot. Um, but if it's say a, for any um, leaf spot disease, and you usually if we just get a branch with several leaves, that, that, that's pretty easy to diagnose. But the, the lab does like to have soil and root samples too. So the, the idea would be um, collect, uh, get photos of the whole plant, get photos close up of the symptoms, if it's leaves, especially the tops and bottom of the leaves, um, and, and if it's a canker or something, try to get any transition zones from, from disease to healthy tissue, because it, it's that transition uh, area that's gonna be the most helpful for diagnosis, um, diagnostics, uh, diagnosis rather. That is where uh, they'll see the bacteria or the fungi are most active, and thus be easy to, easiest to collect that tissue and, and potentially identify the, the, the pathogen. Um, if, if, if I'm, if, if the, if the, if the client is in Chatham County, especially, um, I can potentially meet you there. If they're not, and it's convenient if you don't haven't established a good relation or a much of a relationship with the other agents in, in Orange or, or Durham yet. And because I live so close, I don't mind collecting, coming by and collecting the sample. I've done it for Sam and, and, and David and Michael before. So. That, I'm, that that's possible. Just just communicate with me in advance so I can prepare things. When I submit the sample to the lab or submit the form to the lab, they ask me a ton of questions, um, and so I need to be able to fill all that out. So as as detailed as an explanation as you can get about the sequence of the symptoms, um, and and what's happening in the landscape will be very helpful. So is is it a wet site, dry site, su sun site, shade site? Um, when were samples, when did, when did symptoms start, et cetera, would all be really um, uh, beneficial. So that is uh, a semester course in extension history in 10 minutes. Um, what questions have you got? Yeah, guys, we got, we got time for three to five quick questions. Um, anybody have any questions? Is that an ash? Is that a really bad picture of an ash tree? <laughs> uh, well, if you squint, it depends um, what tarot or astrology system you're using. No, actually, it's... <laughs> <laughs> divination. Uh, I think that was a uh, gloomy scale on maple. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. It's been so long. Um, I think it looks like a clown or 
Rorschach? Yeah, Big Bird, I don't know. Rorschach? Yeah, Rorschach. Yeah, Rorschach. Yeah, that's what I was going for. Matt, I have a question. Yeah. Um, uh. Of, um, maybe not of what the tree has just sent you, yeah. but in this area, what's the most common tree-related question you get uh -huh. versus the common tree-related issue that you're aware of? Oh, um, well... <laughs> I, I do not infrequently get questions like, why is my birch tree bark falling off? Uh, what are those weird, what are those weird growths on the cherry tree bark, you know, the lentils, right? Um, uh, what is this, what is this thing growing on my tree? It's just lichen. So I get a lot of those, you know, um, and, um, with, I have gotten a fair number of questions about emerald ash borer, but those are more educated clients that are looking out for them. They know what an ash tree is. Uh, and under um, appreciated problem is gloomy scale on red maples. Um, if it's in, so Steve Frank, who I didn't mention, he's a professor on campus who studies uh, um, insects on ornamental or, or trees and, and, and herbaceous plants. And he had a, a whole research program looking at gloomy scale and found that the closer they are to compacted soils, urban heat islands, uh, concrete asphalt, that throws off the physiology of the maple to some degree and that makes them more susceptible to gloomy scale, which is a native insect. Um, and then it just proliferates. And it's hard in urban, like street, uh, in like parking lots and stuff, it's hard to find a red maple that's not covered in gloomy scale. So if you see the little black bumps, that's not part of the bark. <laughs> Every one of those is an insect. And so we don't tend to recommend planting those in suburbia anymore. Part of that may, Johnny Randall at the Botanic Garden would argue, I think rightly, that part of that might be um, that the, the, the source stock for red maple may be a single, from a single genetic pool. Um, and, and in fact, even though it's from the southeast, that may even be Oregon or something, where the, the, just the way the industry is developed, the nursery industry develops, there are different areas have specialized in different stages of the, of the plant growing process. So it's possible if it, maybe if we find cultivar, it could get a find a cultivar that's more heat tolerant, that'd be less of an issue. So that's underappreciated. Um, yeah, uh, that's probably my number one. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, actually to that point, I was curious, um, I've run across some literature recently that, that talks about lawns being hotter. And I've never thought of a lawn being a heat sink in the same way that, a, that the middle of a pavement. But like, really? is huh. that something that you guys have talked about, thought about, um, researched? Well, uh, I, I would say I can't speak to that directly, but that's interesting. So in other words, uh, hotter than would normally be if it was just mulched with right. pine straw or something? Yeah, in other words, that, the, wow. uh, that the, because they have such shallow root systems for most of the grasses that we put in our lawn, yeah. um, as opposed to like a native grass that can have roots that go down 12, 18 inches, sure. that, that it actually, these are several degrees warmer at the surface level than, interesting. than a native grass or obviously a forest floor or something like yeah. that. Well, so I would say in the lawn tree interface, more of the issue is people trying to grow Bermuda under a tree or something sure. like that. Yeah. It's like, uh, <laughs> I just mean yeah. in terms of contributing yeah. to uh, a red maple in a front yard not doing well and having gloomy scale and sort of like. Yeah, I, I, I have to, it's been a while since I reviewed Dr. Frank's research, but I think they really found that the bigger, uh, they had some corollary to um, percentage, uh, like over a given area, how much was pavement. And I, I don't know if they observe that in you know, in non-paved non -paved areas or not. But that's interesting. Yeah, uh, less lawns, more trees, right? Okay, we're back to huh? huh? Yeah, exactly. What else? Yeah. How often do you see uh, like a seasonality of things changing, and you see something really some new pattern? Um, are, you, are you are you seeing that? Is it like this spring we saw, or this this time of year? You can list maybe three things that are really dominating the tree, tree, causing tree problems that's kind of new, um, not only to the season, mm -hmm. uh, not only because it's the season, but because this, is, this wasn't happening the last year or, or two years ago. So as, as the season progresses, diseases and pathogens tend to build up, yeah. uh, naturally, obviously, because they're just phenology and how, how insects emerge. Um, in other cases, uh, some diseases here don't overwinter. It's too cold, and so... Many of them will overwinter further south, and they, it takes time for them to blow up, the spores to blow up from Florida. Um, <laughs> insert, for, insert Florida joke there. But uh, so th that can sometimes contribute to late season disease patterns uh, too. Um, 
and uh, I mean, like this spring, I don't know if, if there was a slight delay in insect emergence because of the cool spring, yeah. and then and then it got quite hot, and then yeah, so so that that could be affecting some patterns, perhaps. But are you seeing, uh, you know, just in all the problems that people give you, or maybe like the uh, PDIC? Uh huh. Are they seeing patterns? And if they're seeing patterns, man, it would be nice to get a little report on. Them. Hey. Well, I would say that don't underestimate how there's 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 m more happening all the time than you realize, and and every time I've thought I've shown them something novel and new, they're like, oh yeah, that's nothing. We saw we've seen that since the '70s or whatever. Yeah. So so I think part of it is uh, that maybe just an anecdotal bias, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, um, and I mean they have. If you look on the main PDIC page, they have a Bolo page. Be on the lookout for. And so there's certainly patterns of, of when certain pests and diseases tend to occur based on past history. So that is posted. Right. We have time for one more question. Mm -hmm. Justin, what you got, man? Uh, kind of following up Craig's question, um, are there any diseases or pathogens that are like prevalent in other areas that might be headed our way that we don't know about yet? Or that like the common person here wouldn't know about? But yeah. Um, well, well I, I, like I've... Like my nightmare would be like remorum blight or something. Not remorum. Um, uh, what's the oak? Uh, is it remorum? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. One of those two that are. Um, um, yeah. That 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 it's knocking out oaks either northeast or further west. That's rather no, out west. I guess that's kind of terrifying. I mean, uh, then there is a new apparently a new nemat foliar nematode in beaches that really is not a problem for established trees, but uh, can be a problem in young trees that can completely defoliate them. Most nemat nematodes are roundworms. Usually they're, for plant pathogens, they're soil borne and they either attach to the outside of the root or get in to, in, internally to the root and feed. Um, but there are some that actually um, get dispersed on splashing water and can infect leaves. Is it um, coming the, from the Midwest or the Northeast? I think in the Northeast, um, but yeah, I think that it's right now that it's worse than like uh, um, Ontario, yeah. And then there's a new fun one. I need to oh, follow up with some. Oh God, uh, I have an insect in some alcohol. I haven't looked at it in two weeks. Uh, there's a, a zigzag zigzag sawfly in what is it? Elm. Elm, yeah. Again, mostly benign, but it's it's kind of um, kind of dramatic looking. Um, uh, so that that's that's kind of a new thing. And what else is terrifying? <laughs> yeah, those two, those two come to mind. Yeah, it's. Um, oh God! Yeah, sorry. Yeah, how can we forget that beautiful thing? Um, there. Yeah, we've gotten some close calls in North Carolina, close to us, I'll say. Some yes. Um, some were intercepted. <laughs> but it's really cool. If you see one, call me. I'll call the NCDA. And then before you hang up, there will be like two vans full of people on your site. It's awesome. It's like a SWAT team. No, it's magnificent. Like government at work. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah.